Hi, I'm Amy. I'm a graduate student at MIT, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about Shenango, which is a system that enables applications to achieve um, high CPU efficiency and low tail latency simultaneously. So we've prototyped our system to run on top of unmodified Linux, but we'd be really interested in trying to incorporate some of the ideas I'm going to talk about into Linux as well. And this is joint work with my colleagues at MIT, Josh, Jonathan, Adam, and Hari. There are two major trends in hardware that are impacting data centers today. The first is that networking hardware is getting faster. So if we look at how networking hardware has changed over the last 10 years, you can see that latencies have dropped by a factor of 20 and throughputs have increased by a factor of 100. And faster networking hardware is on its way. But unfortunately, today's operating systems add significant overheads to IO operations because they're not optimized for such fast networking hardware. So this makes it difficult for applications today to achieve the high performance that the underlying networking hardware has to offer. As a result, people are increasingly turning to using kernel bypasses approaches in order to achieve high network performance. So traditionally, cores, which are shown in blue here, are shared between applications and the kernel. In order to send and receive a packet, an application performs a system call, and then the kernel interfaces with the networking hardware. With kernel bypass, applications circumvent the kernel. We dedicate some number of cores to busy spinning, um, and these cores pull the NIC hardware in order to send and receive packets. These cores run only the dedicated application. So this enables much higher throughput and lower latency than the traditional approach because applications avoid the overhead of traversing the kernel for all network operations. At the same time, another major trend is impacting data centers today, and that's the slowing of Moore's law. With the slowing of Moore's law, it becomes more difficult to increase the compute capabilities of an individual CPU. So to keep up with increasing demands for compute, we will require more and more servers, which in turn require more and more energy. To make matters worse, we're not fully utilizing our CPUs today. Across different data centers and clusters, we see utilization numbers ranging from 10 to 66%. So wouldn't it be great if instead of buying more servers, we could use our existing CPUs more efficiently instead? And when I say CPU efficiency, what I mean is the fraction of cycles that are spent performing useful application level work, as opposed to busy spinning or sitting idle. And because of the scale at which these data center applications operate, even a small increase in CPU utilization can save millions of dollars and terawatts of power. Unfortunately, achieving high CPU efficiency is challenging, and the reason for this is that data center workloads experience high variability in load. So for example, load can vary over daily time scales, as you can see in this graph here. But load can also vary over much shorter time scales. So we can have bursts of packet arrivals at microsecond time scale, or threads that are spawned in bursts also at microsecond time scale. So what this means is that peak load requires a lot more CPU resources than average load. So for example, if you run just one application on a server, even if it uses the whole server at peak load, you'll waste a significant amount of CPU resources as load varies over time. As a result, data center operators have turned to multiplexing. In general, there are two main classes of applications within data centers. The first is user-facing applications. These tend to be latency sensitive, and they have demand that varies over time in response to user demands. The second main class of application is batch processing applications. And these typically don't have a user who's waiting immediately for a response on the other end. So we care less about latency and more about just achieving high throughput. And today, data center operators pack both types of applications on the same server in order to achieve high CPU efficiency. So for example, in the past, they might have run latency sensitive applications, such as a memcached key value store, on one set of servers, and on another set of servers run their batch processing applications, such as Hadoop. But today, what you would do is pack both of these applications on all of your servers, and you might pack several other applications on there as well. And this is done in practice today. So for example, Bing does this on over 90,000 servers. So how do existing systems perform in this sort of heavily multiplexed environment? As an example, let's look at the performance we can achieve with memcached. In this experiment, we're going to have a client that sends requests to a server. The server is running memcached. It looks up a response, which takes about a microsecond, and then spends it, sends it back to the client. At the same time, we also run a batch processing application on the server to use any cycles that are not used by memcached as memcached load varies. So what kind of performance would we hope to achieve? On this graph, I'm going to show the performance for memcached. So the x-axis shows the memcached offered load, and the y-axis shows the 99.9th percentile latency. So let's suppose that the maximum throughput that we can achieve on our server for memcached is about 6 million requests per second. We would hope that the tail latency would remain low up until we approach this maximum throughput and then would increase dramatically. At the same time, 
we were also running the batch processing application on the server. So we would expect that at peak memcached throughput, um, we have no cycles to run the batch processing application and achieve no batch throughput. But we would hope that at lower memcached offered loads, we can linearly trade throughput for memcached for throughput for this batch processing application. So this is the results that we see if we run Linux um, in this environment. We can see that Linux achieves pretty poor latency in this configuration, especially if you consider that um, if you run only memcached alone on Linux with no batch processing application, you would have a tail latency of around 50 microseconds in this setting. So the presence of the batch processing application significantly degrades the performance for memcached here. In addition, with Linux, we can't sustain this, this latency for memcached for very high throughputs at all. But Linux is able to multiplex between different applications, so we do achieve some throughput for the batch processing application, as you can see in the lower graph. So now let's look at what happens if you use a state-of-the-art kernel bypass approach. So one example of this is Zygos. So Zygos achieves much better performance for memcached. It maintains low tail latency up to throughputs of over 4 million requests per second. However, in order to achieve peak throughput for memcached, we must statically allocate all of our cores to running memcached. So this leaves no cores available to run the batch processing application. And this means that at lower loads, we're wasting a lot of CPU resources and achieving very poor efficiency. So what we can see from this experiment is that Linux doesn't achieve good performance for memcached, and state-of-the-art kernel bypass approaches don't achieve good performance for batch processing applications. So no existing approach is able to provide high network performance and high CPU efficiency simultaneously. Our goal with Shenango is to reconcile this trade-off between CPU efficiency and network performance. And the way we hope to do this is by granting applications exclusive use of a set of cores and then reallocating cores across applications at microsecond granularity. So we do this every five microseconds. Now you might wonder if microsecond granularity is really necessary. There are existing systems that reallocate cores across applications every 50 to 100 milliseconds. So would one of these approaches be sufficient? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Intuitively, if your tasks take only a few microseconds to complete, you have bursts in load that occur at microsecond timescale, and you can only reallocate cores every 50 to 100 milliseconds, you have to over-provision cores in order to maintain low tail latency. So with coarser granularities of core reallocations, you must sacrifice either CPU efficiency or tail latency. So what's difficult about reallocating cores quickly? One might naively think that you could just take an existing system that reallocates cores at millisecond granularity and just tune it to reallocate cores at microsecond granularity. But unfortunately, this doesn't work because existing approaches have failed to address two main challenges. So first, how many cores does an application need? Some existing approaches use application-level metrics, such as latency or throughput, but these provide feedback only around every 100 microseconds or so, which is too slow for our purposes. In addition, there are multiple sources of load that need to be considered. You can have packets that arrive over the network, but applications can also spawn threads, and both of these impact how many cores an application needs. The second main cha challenge is maintaining low overheads core reallocations. So for example, some prior approaches take hundreds of microseconds to reallocate a core because they reconfigure packet steering rules in hardware, in the hardware NICs every time the core allocations change. So unfortunately, no existing system addresses these challenges. Shenango overcomes both of these challenges with two main contributions. The first is an efficient algorithm for determining when, when applications need more cores. And this algorithm is based on the queuing delays of threads and of packets. This algorithm requires fine-grained, high-frequency visibility into application threads and packet queues, which is not available in existing systems. So therefore, Shenango makes a second contribution, which is in to introduce the IO kernel, a single busy spinning core, which steers packets in software and allocates cores across applications. Because the IO kernel steers packets in software, it can quickly reconfigure packet queues whenever core allocations change. So the result is that core reallocations complete in around five microseconds. In addition to these two main contributions, Shenango makes two other contributions. So we introduce a core where, or a cache-aware core selection algorithm, which decides how to allocate cores to each application based on cache affinity, and also an approach to load balancing, which allows packet protocol handling to be load balanced across cores in addition to application level work. So this enables better performance for unbalanced workloads, such as those with few connections. So let's talk more about Shenango's design. Shenango's design consists of two main components. The first is the runtime. Application logic runs in per application runtimes, one per application. 
Applications link with the runtime as a library, which provides useful programming abstractions such as threads, mutexes, condition variables, and blocking sockets. At any given time, a runtime is, is granted a specific number of cores. Each core has its own local run queue, and application logic runs in lightweight user-level threads, which are placed into these run queues. Work is balanced across cores using work stealing. The second main component of Shenango is the IO kernel. The IO kernel is a single busy spinning core. It pulls NIC queues so that applications don't have to, and steers packets between these hardware NIC queues and per core packet queues in the runtimes. In addition, the IO kernel tracks which cores are idle and how many cores have been allocated to each application. And it orchestrates core reallocations by running the algorithm that determines when applications need more cores. So how should the IO kernel decide how many cores to grant to each application at any given time? There are two main ways that the IO kernel grants an application an additional core. The first is that if packets arrive for an application that currently has no cores granted to it, we can immediately grant it a core. And this is only possible because the IO kernel is on the data path, so it has visibility into packet arrivals. The second way that we grant additional cores to applications is that the IO kernel periodically runs an algorithm to check if applications would benefit from additional cores. And if this is the case, it also grants them an additional core. In either case, granting a core to an application might require preempting a running core from a different application. And when an applications have no work to occupy a core, they yield them voluntarily. So now let's talk more about how this periodic algorithm works. To help us understand how many cores an, applications need, an application needs, we introduce an idea that we call compute congestion. And this term is inspired by the notion of congestion in networking. We say that an application suffers from compute congestion if granting it an additional core would allow it to complete its work more quickly. So for example, if we have an application that currently has two threads and is running on two cores, which one, with one thread on each core, it's not suffering from compute congestion. But if it were to spawn an additional thread, it would now be suffering from compute congestion because this thread could be handled in parallel on a third core. Our goal with Shenango is to grant each application as few cores as possible while avoiding compute congestion. This ensures that we can maintain low tail latency while freeing up underused cores for use by other applications, thereby achieving high CPU efficiency. So how can we detect when compute congestion is occurring? Note that we have to do this efficiently. We cannot afford to spend tens of microseconds determining if an application is congested. So for this, we introduce the compute congestion detection algorithm. This algorithm considers two indications of queuing, or sorry, of congestion. It considers the queuing delay of threads and the queuing delay of packets. The way it works is that it runs every five microseconds. And every time it runs, it checks each of the run queues within a runtime and each of the incoming packet queues. And it checks to see if any thread or any packet has remained queued since the last time we ran this algorithm five microseconds ago. And if this is the case, it grants the application an additional core. And it turns out that we can actually check this very efficiently by implementing these queues as ring buffers. So let's look at an example. Suppose that this is one of the incoming packet queues for this runtime. The head pointer indicates where the IO kernel will end queue incoming packets, and the tail pointer indicates where the runtime will process packets from. So suppose the queue looks like this one time we run the algorithm. Then over the next five microseconds, perhaps some more packets arrive, and the runtime processes some packets. So the next time we run the algorithm, the head and tail pointers have now moved. And we can see by looking at this diagram that there are two packets that remain queued since the last time we ran the algorithm. So this application is suffering from compute congestion. And we can actually determine this quite efficiently by observing that the head pointer from the previous iteration is greater than the tail pointer from the current iteration, indicating that congestion has occurred. If instead the runtime had processed two more packets so that the head and tail pointers were now equal, we would see that congestion was not occurring. So runtimes can expose these head and tail pointers to the IO kernel in a single cache line of shared memory per core. This means that checking for compute congestion can be done efficiently and without expensive synchronization costs. So this contrasts with Linux today, where rebalancing threads across cores requires reading and potentially modifying data structures across different cores in the system which can lead to expensive cache misses and synchronization costs. The two key features of this algorithm are that it considers both queued threads and queued packets as sources of congestion, and that its mechanisms are efficient enough to run every few microseconds. No existing system has either of these features, and these are what make this algorithm really effective. So once we've decided to grant an application a core, we must, must decide which core to grant it. For this, we introduce a core selection algorithm that tries to choose the core with the best cache affinity. So for example, let's consider this CPU topology. It has six physical cores, which are shown in blue. 
each with two hyperthreads. All the cores share the L3 cache, and hyperthreads on the same physical core share the L1 and L2 caches. So suppose an application is currently using these three hyperthreads shown in black, and we want to grant it an additional hyperthread. Different hyperthreads will have better or worse cache affinity for this application. So for example, the hyperthread pair of a currently running hyperthread will have the best cache affinity. But there might be other cores or other hyperthreads that this application has run on recently that also still have some state in their cache. So they would also have fairly good cache affinity. Our core selection algorithm tries to allocate the hyperthread with the best cache affinity first. And then we'll move on to colder to caches with colder to cores with colder caches if it can't allocate that hyperthread. However, it will always grant an idle core if possible because preempting a running core from a different application takes some time. This algorithm is also quite efficient because the IO kernel can track locally which cores each application is running on and which cores it has run on recently. So now I'll describe one feature of Shenango's runtime. The runtime provides useful programming abstractions such as threading, blocking sockets, timers, and mutexes. Shenango runtimes also perform all network protocol handling, such as TCP or UDP processing. <coughs> Within an application, the IR kernel steers raw packets to a specific core based on an RSS hash, and the runtime performs the packet processing. In addition, our runtime includes a unique feature. In addition to allowing the work stealing of threads across cores, our runtime also allows batches of packets to be, sto to be work stolen across cores within an application. So this means that protocol handling work, such as TCP processing, can, be, can also be load balanced across cores instead of being required to be performed on the core at which a packet arrives at. So this yields better performance for imbalanced workloads, such as those with a very small number of connections. One consequence of this work stealing is that packets can arrive at the network stack out of order. This can happen due to work stealing or also as a result of changes in core allocations. So therefore, Shenango includes a lightweight mechanism for resequencing packets before passing them up the TCP stack so that they are generally processed in order and the TCP dynamics are not impacted. We've implemented Shenango. Um, the IO kernel uses DPDK for low latency access to NIT queues from user space. Our runtime includes implementations of UDP and TCP and bindings for C++ and Rust. In total, our system is about 13,000 lines of code, most of which is C. In our evaluation, we focus on three main questions. First, how well does Shenango reconcile the trade-off between CPU efficiency and network performance? Second, how does Shenango respond to sudden bursts in load? And finally, how well does Shenango preserve cache affinity? For our experiments, we use one server and six clients, and all of them run 10 gigabit per second NICs. Clients run our own open loop load generator, which is built on top of Shenango. Requests follow Poisson arrivals and use TCP. And we evaluate four different systems. So first we evaluate Linux, which rebalances tasks across cores at a granularity of four milliseconds. Next, we evaluate Zygos, which is a state-of-the-art kernel bypass networking system, which provides no support for lightweight threading and no mechanisms for reallocating cores across applications. Third, we evaluate Arachne, which is a state-of-the-art user-level threading system which reallocates cores across applications at a granularity of 50 milliseconds. However, Arachne also does not integrate with kernel bypass networking. And finally, we evaluate Shenango, our own system, with, which integrates with kernel bypass networking, provides support for lightweight threading, and reallocates cores across applications every five microseconds. So let's revisit the memcached experiment that we looked at earlier in this talk. To refresh your memory, in this experiment, we had a client that's sending requests to a server. The server is running memcached and sends a response back to the client. And we also run a batch processing application on the server to use any cycles not used by memcached. So we saw that Linux achieved poor performance for memcached, but did achieve throughput for the batch processing application. While Zygos, the state-of-the-art state kernel bypass approach, achieved good performance for memcached, but no throughput for the batch processing application. If we add Arachne to this graph, we can see, we can see that Arachne outperforms Linux. It maintains low tail latency of around 100 microseconds, up to throughputs of around a million requests per second. And at the same time, Arachne is able to adjust core allocations across applications, so it does achieve some throughput for the batch processing application. If we look at how Shenango performs, we can see that for memcached, it maintains low tail latency, similar to that of Zygos, up to a throughput of over five million requests per second. At the same time, Shenango is able to achieve better throughput for the batch processing application than any of the other systems that we evaluated. 
So what we can see here is that Shenango is able to achieve the tail latency of a state-of-the-art kernel bypass approach, while also fully utilizing the CPU for productive work, thereby achieving high CPU efficiency. And there are a couple of interesting things to note about these graphs. So first, if we compare the tail latency of Shenango and Zygos to those of Linux and Arachne, we can see the benefits of using kernel bypass networking. And it's only possible for Shenango to use kernel bypass networking while also reallocating cores across applications this quickly because the IO kernel can reconfigure packet steering rules in software when core allocations change. At the same time, having a single core that forwards all the packets in the system can eventually become a bottleneck. So in this experiment, the IO kernel becomes saturated at around 5.5 million requests per second for memcached, preventing Shenango from supporting higher memcached throughputs. And this is because of the short one microsecond service times of memcached. With longer service times, the IO kernel does not limit throughput. And finally, Shenango achieves higher throughput for the batch processing application than any of the other systems we evaluated. And the reason for this is that Shenango reallocates cores across applications so quickly that it doesn't need to over-provision cores for memcached in order to maintain low tail latency. And this frees up more cycles to be used by the batch processing application. Okay, so in the previous experiment, each data point represented a constant fixed load. But what happens if we suddenly change the load? In this experiment, um, we have a client that sends TCP, requ TCP requests to a server. The server performs one microsecond of synthetic work and then responds to the client. And we also run a batch processing application. And in this experiment, we're going to instantaneously change the load every one microsecond. So this graph shows the load that we're going to offer over the course of the experiment. We begin by offering a baseline rate of 100,000 requests per second. After a second at this rate, we increase the rate to an elevated rate. We maintain the elevated rate for one second and then decrease back to the baseline rate. And we repeat this process for several different elevated rates, up to five million requests per second. So if we look at how Arachne performs, we can see that every time we increase the rate, Arachne's tail latency spikes to over a millisecond. And it takes it hundreds of milliseconds to recover from these spikes. And Arachne can only maintain this load to up to a million requests per second. If we look at how Shenango performs, we can see that Shenango maintains low tail latency across all of these changes in load, even when we drastically increase the load from 100,000 requests per second to 5 million requests per second. And the reason for this is that Shenango reallocates cores across applications 10,000 times as often as Arachne, allowing it to react quickly to changes in load before any queuing builds up in the system. So now I'm going to show how Shenango's core selection algorithm preserves cache affinity. For this experiment, we have a client that sends requests to a server. The server performs some synthetic work with a mean of 10 microseconds and then responds to the client. I'm going to show an execution trace of which core handles each request. So we'll see on the y-axis the CPU number, and the x-axis will show time, which is a thousand times slower than real time. So let's start by looking at how Linux performs. So again, the y-axis here shows which core is handling the request, and each rectangle indicates a request. You can see that in Linux, the requests are handled across basically all the different cores in the system. And over the course of this visualization, the load is increasing. So towards the end of this visualization, you can see that basically all the cores are getting hit by requests. Um, so if you have some state that's shared across these different requests, you're incurring a lot of cache misses trying to handle all of these. So now let's look at how Shenango performs. We can see that even though Shenango is reallocating cores across applications very quickly, it tends to reallocate the same cores over and over again. So if you have state that's shared across requests, um, it's generally only used on a couple of different cores. And as the load increases over the course of the experiment, we're still concentrating our requests on a small number of cores. So there are a lot of cores that are left completely idle to be used by other applications. Um, so to conclude, Shenango is a system that reconciles this trade-off between low tail latency and high CPU efficiency. Um, and the way that it does this is that it reallocates cores across applications at microsecond granularity, so every five microseconds. And this is possible because of two main contributions. First, an efficient congestion detection algorithm. And second, a component called the IO kernel, which is a single busy spinning core that allocates cores across applications and steers packets in software. The code for our system and for running all of our experiments is available on GitHub. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions.
Um, so I'm a little concerned that this is falling, falling into a common trap that we get from kernel bypass in that they will run a kernel bypass. It's not just you. So they run a kernel bypass, and then they compare that to Linux. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. Linux is a general purpose OS. It has many different schedulers. It has many different ways to steer packets. I don't know how much effort was put into optimizing Linux for this particular workload. Because you're comparing this against something that is basically optimized for very specific workloads. So in order to do a fair comparison, we really need to see what the difference is. Why, why is this better? So Linux has an immense number of schedulers. And anyone who's worked in a data center in Linux knows that scheduling is one of the priorities. We need to schedule for batch. We need to schedule for latency. Yes, they need to be combined in the same system. We've done a lot of work there. And I, I, I can't tell how much of that's been applied here. So the comparison um, against Linux, I, I can't derive any conclusions from that. That being said, I am interested in one thing, which is this idea of, of high frequency core allocation. Um, I don't know if we have anything like that in, in the Linux. It might be worth it to look at the schedulers. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of issues with that overhead, and, and certainly you can't bounce um, applications between caches would be insane. So you've obviously solved some of those problems. So it might be interesting to see if some of this is applicable um, to some of that. After all, this is the technical Linux conference anyway, so we always want to know yeah. how can we take stuff like this and apply it productively um, to a larger base. And uh, Linux kernel definitely is the larger base here. Yeah, I think um, we definitely would be really interested in trying to apply some of these ideas to Linux. Um, yeah, so I would love to talk to people who have opinions about that. Um, and to address your first point, I agree that evaluating things on Linux is really tricky because there are a lot of different ways you can configure it. Um, we, did a, we did invest substantial time in trying out a lot of different configurations, so we really tried to configure it as best we could. It's very possible that there's a better configuration um, for the applications that we uh, ran. There's a, there's a simple note to be made here, right, which is uh, all of the state-of-the-art kernel bypass technologies are deployed in almost zero places, right, and, and Linux is deployed everywhere. And there's a reason, because people have figured out how to make it work. Yeah. There's uh, a question? Yeah, so I, you started it off with the problem you were solving, which I thought was really good, but have we asked, is, you know, so we're sort of looking at like a micro orchestration of cores, right? <clears throat> and the reason is maybe because we failed at the macro orchestration, you know, like you, you're saying, Bing combines all these things. Could we approach it from solving the bigger problem of just trying to put things on systems and hardware that, you know, the way they should be running, like memcached DM1 and, you know, Hadoop on a, on a different system, like, you know, sort of coming at it from the other way. I think this is still useful, but I, I wonder if we're not doing the work there, too, that we need to do. I think the problem with that is just that since there's so much burstiness in these different workloads that we see in data centers, it's hard to like perfectly provision things. Um, so if you could, you know, provision like by fractional CPUs, then you wouldn't have this problem. But if you have to provision by whole machines, then you're going to have to run multiple applications on the machine in order to make sure you're still using it as the load changes over time. Quick question, how much of the win of your system comes from the shorter scheduler quanta versus the smarter core scheduling, specifically cache aware uh, core scheduling? Um, that's a good question, which we haven't concretely evaluated, but I think I would say like the vast majority of it is from um, the shorter time schedule, the time quanta. So I had, I had one additional comment. So uh, since you're running this at 10 gig, it is, I, I think you will find that the Linux kernel will do a lot better if you start running at much higher throughput and you have to now do more than five, six million operations per second on your IO kernel and you have to load balance that guy and you're going to have to be NUMA aware and all the problems that you have to have with locality will need to get addressed. So it would be interesting to see what these, what the results look like if you're running at like a 40 gig or a 100 gig NIC and a much wider load, not two or three threads, but maybe 20, 30 threads hitting the same thing. Uh, and have you guys run a wide experiment like that? Um, so most of our experiments were conducted on 10 gigabit per second NICs because that's what we had available to sure. us. Um, but we recently got some 40 G NICs, so we're starting to look into this. It'll be very interesting to see what those results look like. Any last question? All right, well, thank you, Amy. I think there was.
Oh, there was a question? Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, where's the... Congratulations. Uh, I'm very impressed by the work you did. Um, I have um, one sort of a question. Uh, would it be useful for you if you could identify the flows that are or the connections that are associated with a particular application and then not share the cues over there, but just you know assign them their own individual set of cues? Okay. Uh, you mean assign them their own individual hardware cues? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I think there are a lot of features um, of NICs that could make this sort of like steering a lot easier. Um, so I think we that's can talk example. offline. I can show you how to uh, at least configure some of the Intel NICs if you're using them. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> 